Good morning, and thank you for joining Using Data Analytics to Unlock True Profit Potential Across Not for Resale Expenses with David Panino, CEO of Logic Source, and Joe Seed, COO of Logic Source. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the conversation, to please use the QA function at the bottom of your screen. Now, here is your host, Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Coresight Research. Thank you, Drew, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're here to talk about a topic that we're, I would say, hearing more about from, from retailers and brands as we are experiencing some, some very interesting dynamics around pricing and expenses right now. Goods not for resale, or GNFR for short, uh, can represent up to 20% of retailer and CPG companies' revenues. Uh, really an astonishing number when you think about it. I'm very honored to be here with David Panino and Joe C to discuss how this kind of reservoir of costs, if you will, presents truly an untapped opportunity for businesses to think about you know, improving profit potential as we emerge from the pandemic. And I think we've all been you know, addressing so many things, plugging so many holes, we probably haven't had the opportunity to really kind of step back and think about these opportunities, especially as we head into holiday season. So for, so for those of you who don't know David, he's the president and CEO of Logic Source, and as also an amazing founding partner of the firm, uh, David and I have known each other for truly quite some time as I've always found this to be, especially as a Wall Street analyst, which is when I met David, really a very interesting kind of line, if you will, um, in the income statement. And as we start to kind of pull it apart, just the, the true opportunity here that exists, so David really focuses on kind of three key areas at the firm. Number one, corporate strategy, including category and footprint ex expansion. Number two, product and service marketing and positioning. And lastly, client service and new client acquisition. And uh, talking to any of Logic Source's clients, they, they've all been incredibly happy. And David's obviously doing an incredible job. Secondly, we have Joe C, who's the Chief Operating Officer, COO at Logic Source, and Joe is really responsible for the vision, strategy, operational execution for all shared services, technology, and client site teams. And he really helps to ensure cross-functional service delivery for all of Logic Source's current and prospective clients. So two key people to know here. So while uncovering GNFR cost savings through spend and data analytics really is very kind of underutilized across the retail and CPG industry, which is why I feel it's this just kind of huge profit potential, you know, leaders acknowledge, especially, you know, kind of CEOs and, you know, kind of across the C-suite that data analytics really can help and, and does. And, and, and once they kind of think about it and dive into it, I think they're, they're surprised at kind of just how much the opportunity is. But oftentimes this data lives in silos and, and that's a lot of what Logic Source does is to help us kind of uncover um, you know, the, the true opportunities here. So, so number one today, we'll talk about the opportunity for cost savings across GNFR for retail and CPG companies, you know, kind of emerging from the pandemic. Number two, how leveraging spend and data analytics can help companies manage GNFR costs and uncover new savings opportunities. And lastly, number three, approaches for a best in class data analytics function to accelerate you know, really the realization of GNFR profit improvement initiatives. So let's go ahead and get started. We have, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I mean, that's why I feel this is such a, an interesting opportunity to talk to Joe and David today, is what are goods not for resale expenses, right? Because there there's so many kind of, you know, things on this page. And you know, as, as retailers search for cost savings initiatives, this, this huge kind of potential is, is significant. And these goods do not, so, so how, how we've looked at it from a core site perspective, right, is that to make it simple, these goods do not factor into the direct cost of manufacturing a product or purchasing a finished good for resale. So they're really considered indirect costs. I think that's a, a very easy way to kind of think about it. But, but, but David, this is just such a, a, a significant, I mean, there, there, there's many different opportunities on this page and there's so many different aspects, David, as you and I know of running a business, who tends to oversee all of the expenses? Yeah, it, it's, it, it really depends. I mean, you have organizations that have really prioritized good not for resale procurement. I mean, think of folks like Unilever or Walmart who have really attacked this. 
You know, what we find every day though, you know, doing 20, 30 big deep dives into organizations is that most organizations really haven't tackled this. And you've got shadow procurement within functions in the business trying to be, if you will, marketers during the day and kind of buy and negotiate at night or IT innovators by day and, and negotiate at night. And, and it, it really is an unmanaged set of categories in most organizations. And, and it can be hundreds of categories uh, uh, that you would require domain expertise and, and, it, and it can be thousands of transactions and initiatives a year. And I think that that's what's daunting. When I think about what our retail clients have built in the merchandising department, you know, they, they really haven't duplicated that on the GNFR side, which is buying hundreds, if not thousands of categories of things and making sure they're managing the company's money effectively. So I think the net of it is it's not uniformly managed, which is a challenge. So, so if we think about this, do, do these, you know, kind of expenses tend to live in different silos or, or how do, you know, how do organizations kind of pull all this data together because that seems to me to be the, the complexity here. Yeah, I think one of the things that's still staggering to us, we've been at this for almost 13 years, you know, all we do is this for a living and, and it's still staggering to us how few companies really know what they buy, who they buy it from, how much they pay for it, who buys it, why they buy it. Um, it's still the biggest challenge we have is data, understanding where they're spending their money. Um, and I think it, it unlocks all of this. And, and I've seen countless companies pay a fortune to consulting firms to sell them very expensive PowerPoint, telling the board they could save money, but it's not rooted in data. And, and therefore, you know, when you poll, we polled about 450 CFOs, 67% of them said the savings never matriculate to the P&L because they haven't solved the data problem at the front of the business. So the savings end up in lost opportunity reports uh, versus actually hitting the P&L. And I guess one last question, if I, if I, uh, you know, kind of go back to the early days of my career when I was in, in public accounting, right, and trying to kind of just get everything to, to match up and into the right buckets, do, do you feel that, you know, organizations even truly understand some of their spend? So as they're kind of putting it into kind of these, these different repositories, is there an understanding of, right, how they're defining marketing and, you know, different services that, that are GNFR? And how are they doing that consistently across the organization? Because I guess that to me is also a whole nother layer of opportunity. Yeah, I think, Joe, I'd be interested in your perspective. I think we see it, it depends on the organization, but you, you, you see it in some areas. You know, corporate service is a good example of like the amorphous blob that's very hard to manage. And it's just, it's just a, a, a dog breakfast of categories. Um, you know, usually IT is pretty tightly managed, for example. Um, you know, but, but you only buy what you buy. So you, you need help from outside your four walls, but there's other categories like facilities and corporate services that can be a bit, you know, uh, disparate in nature and therefore nobody's really managing, but Joe, you know, I don't know what your perspective would be. Yeah, I think, um, I think that all of that's right. I think the, the other thing I'd add is um, there's often some, because of the, the way that business is emerging, um, take marketing technology, for example, you know, the, the pace of change with some of those solutions that's out there in the market at the moment is such that people are, uh, are feeling like they've got to have it, um, but it's ending up potentially in IT's budget, but the relationship and the supplier is being managed out of marketing. So you end up with this, to your point, kind of blurred budget ownership and relationship ownership. And that um, over time leads to unmanaged costs and you know, potentially unmanaged suppliers. So um, what happens is you know, that's a lot of potentially kind of small contracts that start to build up over time without that kind of uh, one view of the governance. And we see that today's point, corporate services, is another good example of where that bleeds between potentially sort of IT and HR costs, et cetera. So it is out there, it's definitely a challenge. And I think, um, you know, not having one view of the data um, for, you know, X supplier across all departments is really kind of the main, the main challenge that analytics helps solve. So you can bring that, that risk mitigation control and, and spend reduction uh, into, into the action plan. We do have a question from the audience. Actually, we have a few. And so please just use the Q&A function or chat, whatever is easiest for you. And we'll get those questions addressed during the call today. Uh, across those functions, which, this is from Susie, across those functions, which represents the biggest area of cost savings? Yeah, interesting. You know, uh, I'll give you my perspective being in the deals every day and then Joe, you know, having to deliver. Um, you know, I, I think it, you know, one wants to say it depends, but it depends. 
Um, I would say to organize it, there are set and forget categories like travel and office supplies and things of that nature that you know can provide some benefit. But it's the big complex categories, the stuff that 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 really requires digging in where the big opportunity can be. And and very often, although sixty percent of the value we drive in year one is typically rate based savings. You, you can really drive efficiencies in process and, and, and taking out really inefficient ways of doing business across all these categories. But I'd say, you know, marketing always pops up to the top um, as a huge opportunity to, to drive cost reduction or reinvest to market deeper. Um, corporate services is typically undermanaged, so there's always gold in, in, in those hills. Um, I, I think, you know, facilities is, is, is a similar, you know, category. IT, we usually have very diligent IT executives who are kind of by their nature negotiators. I think the opportunity there is really competitive tension from outside your four walls. Um, there's other categories that right now are difficult, you know, given what's going on around the world. Distribution logistics is hard. Um, everybody's, you know, dramatically increasing, um, you know, Ecom and you know the the everything from open to trucking to small parcel is really constrained right now. But um, you know I would say the big three are marketing, corporate services, and and probably facilities uh, as as the ones that pop out the biggest. Joe, you know, what would your perspective be? I'd agree. I think that the what we're seeing you know across some of the others, and I'll pick on IT. It's it's another big obviously sort of uh, section of the budget for most organizations is um, where procurement can help is just the volume of work that we're seeing spike up now that everyone is re-emerging from, from the events of, of 2020. Um, we're seeing our in, in our retail CPG portfolio, a lot of IT ramp up in terms of user experience and kind of digitization. Um, and so where procurement is helpful is, you know, A, kind of managing those CapEx expenses and helping maybe sort of defer some for reinvestment. Um, but, but B, just managing the supply base and kind of helping action, you know, discussions into contracts, into relationships. So there's value there beyond the pure cost savings, which you know tends to show up in capex, obviously. But um, but um, but that's that's kind of the only thing I'd add on from an IT perspective is just extra extra horsepower to get work done more quickly to get these suppliers on board. That's great. So I think we're, as we're moving on the next slide, I do. There's a, another question that we got from Michael, uh, who says, "Interesting. As a retailer that sells multiple product categories, does GNFR look?" different when evaluating indirect costs across different product units. Hmm. Joe, what do you think of that one? Um, I think uh, I think there's there's commonality. So I think you know even even um, organization to organization, people would say there's difference when you look at GNFR categories, but um, often um, when we dig in, we find it's actually some of the same end suppliers that are providing those services across businesses and across products. So um, there is commonality. I think you've got to get at the data to be able to start pulling on that thread and seeing, hey, where do I see supplier X across these different products and how might I bring that, therefore, that, that, uh, that, that spend together and actually have a kind of leveraged discussion with that supplier um, versus kind of biting off each one individually. So, uh, you know, we see actually a fair amount of of commonality uh, from in the supply base across products and across brands. Even. Yeah, one, one of the things we see often is multi-divisional corporations don't recognize their own group leverage because they're operating in silos and, and their buy is actually substantially greater with their supply chain, but their suppliers are given the opportunity to kind of pick them apart because they're not buying as in one organization. Um, so that, that can be a big opportunity. That to me is always, David, I, you know, especially from a, an analyst perspective, right? When, when retailers had this kind of like big aha around that, what, what usually gets them to that or, you know, from a, a logic source perspective, as you're going through, how, how do they kind of take those insights, put them into action? Because I do think that this idea, right, because you get different people, especially if they're, you know, kind of a, um, operating, you know, different formats or different, uh, you know, kind of brands, how, how does that kind of key component come together usually? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's funny. We, we joke, you know, around the water cooler, if you will, and, and how shockingly hard it is to save companies money. Um, you, it really comes down to leadership. You know, I think our best projects, our best clients are sponsored by CFOs typically who um, bring their leadership team together and say, we're going to, we're going to all join arms and drive profit improvement. And, and they make the trade-offs on what's going to be a reinvestment decision openly and honestly. 
um, and they drive top down. You know, our, our best clients have started with, okay, logic source, what would we need to believe to take $60 million out of the business? You have five weeks to tell us, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it, you know, versus a bottoms up, can't, won't, shouldn't, don't kind of approach. Um, and how might we approach has been much more successful. I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to executive sponsorship and leadership saying, we're going we're gonna to drive a culture of efficiency and we're all in this together and find the nearest door marked exit if you're not in. No, that's a really great point. And I mean, as we you know, kind of focus on GNFR expenses and you know, how these retailers are, are improving their profit margins, you've got these strategies that are allowing them to, to really kind of, I would say, you know, reverse some of these declining profit margins, especially as we're seeing, you know, we've talked about inflation as being just a, you know, in the C-suite right now, I think it's, it's really the hottest topic. You know, as we look at this proprietary survey that we fielded, you know, the majority, you know, over 82% say that their, their businesses have strategies in place to build GNFR management capabilities, including investing in an in-house procurement team or outsourcing GNFR, you know, functions to control GNFR costs. You know, what, what everyone says in terms of having a strategy and executing it can be two different things. How do you kind of think about that, David? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. You know, I don't, uh, you, you, you came from Wall Street. I don't manage my own money because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I, I use a third party, um, and, and I think the same thing goes for goods not for resale. I don't think it's the core competency of our clients, um, and I think they should ask for help. Um, and, and I think when they ask for help, um, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but I want somebody that's managed my money that's been successful, um, you know, and, and, and actually manages their own money. I think that there's a lot of consultants out there that, that lovingly don't buy anything, and, <laughs> and they don't do anything. So I wouldn't hire them to do goods not for resale procurement. I want I would want somebody who actually buys stuff for a living and brings substantial leverage and know-how to the party um, and growing knowledge and, and buying power in the market. So I would, whether you do it with a firm um, or have a firm do it for you, I would use third-party expertise and I would zero on, in on those that actually buy a lot of stuff because at the end of the day, the, these markets, DNFR is not unlike any other market, it moves. It moves daily. So if you're putting rate cards in place with a consulting firm with a three-year spend cube, it's old a quarter later. The market moved. So you have to be able to be constantly in market and driving more leverage and more competitive tension. You have to manage that spend. You have to work that spend monthly, weekly, you know, to make sure you're maximizing your investment dollars. And I think that's the key is this isn't a consulting project with really fancy PowerPoint. This is dirty fingernails, managing the spend, just like a money management analogy. It has to be worked every day to counteract what the market's doing. You know, it's interesting, David. I mean, you know, going back to kind of like my Wall Street days when we first met, I think that I was doing a lot in FX at the time. And like, I, as I thought about, right, FX rates move, they move daily, right? And, and if you think about the, the opportunities, right, the, the costs move daily and certainly having somebody who's an expert who can help you manage that that daily kind of fluctuation is, I mean, that's that's really you know kind of a, a gift, if you will. Uh, fascinating. The poll came back, um, so we want to thank all of you for participating. Seventy-five percent of those who participated said that the business, which is I think why why you're here today, um, is not actively managing GNFR. And then, if yes, do you think your organization is doing enough to manage GNFR expenses? Um, you know, not not doing enough. So I, I, I think that what we see is just this, you know, kind of huge unlock, this huge potential. And, and David, right, our, our research, our proprietary research shows that over 50% of those who, you know, kind of participate in our survey have seen three to 5% profit improvement by addressing GNFR costs. I've always thought, you know, that's just kind of almost like the baseline. When, when you're working with clients, do you see that kind of profit improvement? Is that, you know, kind of standard? Yeah. Is yeah, that, I, is think, I think what we typically see, Deborah, is it, it's about 20% of revenue is GNFR. And if you want to if you want to uh, handicap this for folks listening, take 10% off the top and say it's in long-term contracts, there's an emotional supplier relationship. So now say it's 10% of revenue, right, to be conservative. You should be able to drive 7 to 14% on 10% of revenue within to one of the questions that was just asked. You should start seeing savings matriculate to the PL within the first quarter, and you should be at full ramp if you're running at a, play, at a pace by month 18. 
And, and Joe, how do organizations ensure that they can realize these kinds of results? Because these these are big numbers. Yeah, I think um, I, th I think Dave made the point around procurement aligning under finance and having that kind of top down mandate. I think that's key. Um, I think also just the the connective tissue between procurement and FP&A is critical. And then building on that, you know, we have a sort of triangle with the with the budget owner and the business unit uh, as the third the third party in that conversation. So that when procurement starts a project, FP&A agrees with the baseline lining up to the budget. Uh, the business unit owner approves. Everyone holds hands and, and we run off and, and go execute the project. And that's how you trap savings into the budget. Uh, come come the end of the engagement, come the end of the, that particular project. And often what we find is there's a disconnect between at least two of those three parties in terms of perhaps procurement hasn't asked FP&A or aligned there or the business unit isn't aligned in terms of um, capturing the savings and having them moved out of the budget into, you know, re realignment, reinvestment, you know, drop to the bottom line, whatever the, the business as a whole needs to do. So I think those are the challenges that, you know, we order of business number one for us coming into a new engagement is let's solve those challenges as we ramp up these projects so we don't get to the end and there's a disconnect between procurement thinking the saving is this the business unit thinks it's this and finance thinks it's something different those are the things that we uh, we look to solve for david and joe this question is for both of you so do you do you find because of some of those complexities joe that you just mentioned are the kind of is this untapped potential typically is it different at, at larger, more complex organizations? Do, what do you see in terms of a commonality? Hi, Jim. I, I would say um, it's different flavors of the same problem um, in most of the places we look, even in large organizations, there's still that, that level of disconnect. So, um, you, you know, obviously there are varying scales of that in terms of there's nothing there or there's something there or there's, you know, it's, it's foundational that needs to be evolved. But this is a this is a kind of daily slash common occurrence for us in 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 new clients that we walk into and uh, and start working. With. And and then just David, one one other question on this slide before we move on is as we think about that three to five percent, how long does that take to to happen? And and once you know organizations kind of scratch the surface, do they need to come back and revisit this year on year? How how do you, how should we think about that? Yeah, it's interesting. We usually build out three different savings um, uh, programs for clients. One is 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 rate based savings or commercial savings. So that's usually your fastest, um, and it's your lowest emotion. About sixty percent of the suppliers stay the same usually, and it's just rate based. You're over market. We have fifty billion of data going through the company. It's growing by ten billion a year. We can use that data to say, guys, you're over market, and adjust those prices. So commercial savings tend to come the fastest. And you have WIP to contend with, and you have contracts to contend with. So I'd say the fastest you're, you're going to see is, you know, a month uh, that, you know, to, to start seeing savings depend on work in progress and, and contracts. Um, usually that rate based stuff is at least in your first phase is all done by month 18 at the outer beacon. You know, you're, you're implementing the only reason it takes that long is you might have a contract in place. You might have inventory already. Um, there's operational savings, which is really changing the way work gets done. This may be, we have an in-house print shop. Why do we have that? We have cell phones. We should go to bring your own device. You know, we're using a private jet. We don't need that. So there's operational savings that, that can um, change the way we're doing business to remove obsolescence um, and create efficiency. Um, and that usually takes more time because you have to build, you know, the, the trust of the organization. You know, let's say everybody in the office has a printer in their office. People aren't even going to the office right now. Uh, but when they are, how about we just put printer banks on each floor and everybody can walk to a printer and we get out of all that toner and all that maintenance. That may be conceived as a takeaway. Um, so we have to work the organizational culture to do operational things like that. And then last is technical savings, which are specification changes or re-engineering. So, so the, the projects kind of never stop. I, our, one of our largest clients, Big Lots, we're on year 10. Um, wow. of bring with Big Lots. Um, and, and we delivered... Um, a big percentage of EBITDA last year on year 10. And here we are in year 11 and we're still paying for ourselves three times over. So, you know, it, it never stops because their business hasn't stopped. They keep growing, they keep innovating, uh, new categories pop up all the time, new initiatives pop up all the time. So I think, you know, if the business stays completely stagnant or shrinks, maybe procurement eventually runs out of room, but if the business is growing and innovating, it kind of never stops. 
Um, we've gotten a question from the audience that I want to address, which is what's changed after COVID? I would say technically we're, we're still here, but I guess, you know, kind of what's changed after the crisis and, and maybe how do you think about the kind of next steps for, you know, some of these organizations? I, I think the biggest thing COVID did to be positive is I would meet with CFOs that say, you know, Dave, I think we're just doing too well for you. And, you know, I, I will share, I will not share their names because those companies aren't doing as well as they were when they said that to me. Um, you know, COVID made everybody get efficient. And I think everybody wanted to, um, whether you were not essential and you weren't open and you had to be efficient fast, or you were open and you were essential and you're worried about keeping up these comps with Wall Street when everybody else is open too, you all need to be efficient. And I think some of those barriers that we're just doing too well for you to come and look at cost are gone. And, and I think it's created pace around performance improvement. Um, I think spend management and performance improvement is getting a seat at the boardroom where it never has before. Um, and I think that's the biggest change from COVID. If you, if you think about what's happened with procurement, right? Think about the CIO. Years ago, the CIO was an MIS director. They pushed an AV cart. They had screwdrivers in their pocket. And when they went to work every day, they went down and you all went up. They put on a suit, they gave the screwdrivers to Xerox and they gave the mainframe to IBM and they started talking about innovation and omnichannel and they became the CIO. Well, procurement had the same problem. Procurement as a title assumed somebody's already made a strategic decision and you're just executing the buy. I think spend management, it, it, the term is becoming a productivity engine. It's becoming a tool to fund innovation, to fund the store of the future and the customer experience of the future post COVID. And I think that's the biggest change is it's become strategic. Uh, that's, that's interesting. We, um, we have another poll for those of you in the audience. And yeah, I think this idea that this is kind of maybe now this strategic advantage, right? For many organizations is definitely, you know, I think elevating it to a place that it hasn't really been before. I think this, you know, kind of um, the, the question that this slide addressed, right? Are data analytics becoming increasingly important across sourcing and procurement strategies? I mean, I just think data analytics in, in, in general, right? But, but especially here, right? Where I think there, there's a little bit less transparency. And so, you know, although underutilized today, you know, utilizing data analytics to support profit improvement, you know, for GNFR is, is really effective. So David, can you talk through some of the, the numbers on this slide? Sure, I'm going to pass that one to Joe. I think, Joe, you're more qualified than I am on this one. Yeah, happy to. So I think um, I think the, the, the numbers tell the story in terms of, uh, of, of you know, being more much more important than five years ago, or at least more important than five years ago. I think um, it, it's a surprise to us how few organizations um, have, have anything in this space, and many folks are, are trying to gather data with a mix of kind of their ERP system and Excel files. Um, and that is uh, being done by a procurement team, which, uh, you know, as we as we saw in the poll just now, and, and, and really in our experience is underfunded, right? So you've got an under-resourced team with little manpower trying to gather data to drive business decisions, which is difficult to access and requires hours to sift through and trying to consolidate. Um, and I think, uh, you know, all of that is driving the, the need for, you know, replace ERP plus Excel with online spend visualization, pulling data from multiple systems and real time views of what the organization's spending and with who. So you can you can bring data driven uh, decisions and recommendations into business units and finance for projects. And what's happening at the moment in business is decisions are getting faster and faster and faster and faster and the pressures mounting because of the events of last year and frankly, just the way that um, you know, organizations are developing and technology is developing. So um, this probably answers answers all those points in terms of the data around people's people's growing awareness of this, although it's surprising to me that um, a lot of organizations, you know, won't spend what is not a huge amount of money um, to invest in a platform like this to solve those challenges, given the given the ROI on the, on, on the payback. I, I just think that there, there's often, I mean, it goes back to, right, this, you know, kind of this 57.2%, this, this proprietary survey, you know, about the, the importance of spend data analytics, right, because I, I think due to the complexity of these organizations, and especially now, right, with the majority of organizations having at least some part of their workforce that's remote, it, I do think it's, it's more challenging. You know, David, along those lines, do you think that retailers and brands have the, do, do, they, ha do they understand the data, number one? 
And then do they have the resources to, to cut costs or to really kind of analyze this data? And, and if, if not, why not? I mean, why inherently, I mean, and, and maybe, you know, taking a step back, right? When, when the, when Logic Source was founded, you know, were you just like, this is like this huge aha that, that, that nobody's doing this? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. When we started the firm, we, we, we believed in, in 2009 that th there was a huge opportunity to create a, a corporate Costco, if you will. You know, someone that focused on buying on all the stuff that's not for sale. And, and the thesis back then hasn't really changed. You know, think about the size of the merchandising department at pick a, pick a retailer. And then think about the size of the Janet Farr department. Right. And then think about the career path. A chief merchant can become the CEO. You know, where does the where does the procurement path in a large retailer? Right. And, and I think that you, you just you look at it on the surface and, and they're putting a lot more wood. They're putting a lot more focus and attention on buying the things they sell than all the other stuff that enables them to sell. Um, it, it's a fraction of the budget. PNFR than it would be for merchandising. So, you know, imagine if a, if a retailer spent the same amount of time, rigor, automation, focus, if it was the same kind of career path for GNFR that it is for merchandising, how well they'd probably buy. Um, the, but the, the other big difference is, you know, if you're, if you're Lulu, if you're Gap, if you're, you know, Neiman, you know, you, you better be good at buying the stuff you sell. That's your brand promise, right? That, that, that's going to drive your margin. You, you don't necessarily need to be good at buying fixtures. You don't necessarily need to be good at buying armored car or credit card processing or negotiating with HVAC repair folks. So I think the biggest decision is to know what to focus on and what not to focus on. One of our CEOs, uh, you know, who, who ran a massive pharmaceutical uh, retailer uh, said to us once, you know, this is like priority 99. I got, I got all these things I have to do to, to run this massive pharmaceutical retailer. This isn't one of them, but it'll fund priority one through 10. So I need somebody to do it for me. And I think that's the, the, the hurdle that I think our, our clients are coming through, which is if you try to build this internally, you're gonna have a really hard time justifying the expense for the amount of category managers you would need. I mean, if you just close your eyes and think about the inside of a store, how many categories there are just in that one store. There's music playing, there's a dumpster out back, there's an armored car that picks up the cash, there's pictures, flooring, lighting, there's gift boxes, there's standees, there's hangers, there's mannequins. There's all, somebody has to know all that stuff. And that's just one store. So how do you justify the expense to be really great at all that? You can't. So you got a part. You know, you know, it's really interesting, David, just some, something that you said is, you know, if we think about this, right, and, and this big push right now in sustainability, and, you know, if, if you don't double up, if you are smarter about what you spend on GNFR, I mean, there is, right, I mean, we look at that as like the, the, just the foundation of every organization right now. I mean, this is really a key component because you are spending more wisely, and there is a long-term implication as as firms are you know as organizations are are engaging logic source or or you know considering it how how much is kind of the the ESG the sustainability conversation DNI coming into play or or are we just scratching the surface there yeah I mean I think we're just scratching the surface Joe what, what would you say definitely I think um I think um uh, the where, where organizations that are looking to, to us for help in our conversations is very much again a data question around hey first of all i need to understand of my existing supply base across gnfr what percent of uh, diversity do i actually have now um so that i can actually build that as a baseline from which to project the goals and objectives of my idea program my de and i program um and, and and run that forward the same honestly for sustainability and you know, how that pops up across um, across some of the uh, sort of subsets of categories where that's where that's most relevant, and um, there is an awareness or data or information easily accessible, um, at much less you know the, the 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 sort of bandwidth or the funding to go invest in those tools. So so that's uh, that's I think um, where where at least in our world people are is hey I'm just trying to understand where I'm at now. That so in terms of scratching the surface, where you can take that um is uh is obviously sort of a green field let's say in terms of uh in terms of uh, the opportunity and i think uh what we're talking about here is is intrinsic to organizations being able to sort of successfully kind of have metrics and measurement and performance management against achieving 
what it is they set out to do with those programs. That that is, I mean, I think we all should just pause. Here. I mean, the the opportunity around that is, is quite significant. And once again, having kind of, you know, one one you know one partner like a logic source being able to you know help you understand, I, I think is just you know it's like table stakes right now. And yeah. you know, there, there's so many other things that organizations have to focus on that that this and and being able to have a trusted partner seems to me to to be you know really just mission critical. Yeah, interesting. The so as we as we look at the data on this slide, right, and and the kind of impact that you know just having the science, if you will, to to manage and reduce expenses, you know the the numbers here are just kind of truly outstanding, and you know if we if we think about this this thirty percent, I mean our survey found that roughly thirty percent of respondents are will be lever you know willing to leverage data analytics to address GNFR. David, does that 30% surprise you or would you have thought that would have been higher or lower? It, it doesn't surprise me. I think it, it, I think we're on a journey for, with organizations starting to embrace data analytics. I think, I think the key is, um, you know, where's the data coming from? I and mean, someone just asked a question, are there use cases where we can share analytics that led to cost savings? I think it depends on where the data is coming from because harnessing your own group data is critical first knowing what you buy, who you buy it from, how much you pay for it. But then you only buy what you buy. So you have to get access outside your four walls. I grew up at Gartner, which our entire business model was aggregating data to, to help people make better decisions, right? So, so to, to this question, you know, I'm thinking of a retailer, Joe, in Ohio, where within minutes we could see that their security guards in North America were 8% higher than our average security guard rate with the same supplier across our client portfolio in the US. And in Canada, they were 13% higher. So day one, we haven't done anything yet. We can lower your price by 8% on security guards in North America, 13% in Canada, same supplier. Move the chains, earth down. That sort of stuff allows us every day to drive quick wins within our, our client organizations. It also helps us validate where they're buying really well. So don't fix what isn't broken. So analytics, always lead to you know the first phases in fact when we first engage with a client the first thing we do is a value prototype that basically uses the analytics exclusively and says based on what you buy based on the company of your size all we do is deal with companies in tpg and retail here's what the savings should be by category level one level two statistically speaking and shockingly we come in on the number when we come out behind that and do the work no, that's really helpful. I mean, to me, right, this slide, right, talking about it's always about the bottom line, ultimately, and and that's how we're going to see, you know, kind of companies make make real time decisions, and you know, the the survey respondents really believe that these insight insights can drive significant bottom line savings and and generate greater business value, and ultimately, right, I mean, their their shareholder value here, which is you know ultimately what I think we're all all aiming for. So, so David, what kind of help, you know, kind of do procurement teams usually look for to be able to, to just kind of access this data? I mean, this is the, this I think is critical, right? To access the data and then to be able to action it. Yeah, I, I think that um, most of our procurement officers are trying to build business cases for automation. <laughs> and, and the first thing they want is help showing their executives um, what they could do if they harness their data appropriately. So usually step one is we organize their data into a multi-tiered taxonomy. We clean it all up for them and, and put it into a hypothesis or a prototype that shows them where the value should be statistically speaking across the organization. And it's always fascinating when we do that and you sit down with a CFO and very often they don't know that a, at a multi-tiered taxonomy, they might know what their marketing budget is, but they may not know down level two, level three, where they're spending money. Um, across the organization. And I think that the biggest thing we're, we're finding as it pertains to analytics is helping our CPOs get the tools approved within the organization so they can start to mine their data. Um, mm -hmm. It's still staggering to me how hard it is to get these kinds of automation projects approved. That's, you know, kind of really critical. And I think this, you know, going, looking here, right, this when you think about the kind of full scope and the, you know, kind of the opportunities really around uh, a spend analytics program, you know, Joe, how do you think of the, the benefits here and, you know, where do companies typically have, 
you know, the greatest opportunity? I think across the board. I mean, uh, these are all these are all things that pop out of uh, of the uh, the benefits of uh, of having data readily accessible. Um, you know, obviously, our conversation is focused on optimized cost savings, but you get that by having improved supplier management uh, by by being able to source with data. So I think um, you know that the, the the points here all kind of uh, add up to the same end result, which is efficiency and and cost reduction across the board. Well, and the analytics data is interesting, but it also should be coupled with contracts data. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, one of the things that we're finding is that same suppliers have wildly varying terms across clients. Um, so not only using the analytics to harness spend information and price information, but also what are key terms and what are other clients getting from the same supplier that you're not getting? You know, what's really interesting, David, is we've talked to a few retailers recently, right, as we're seeing this move towards, once again, all with a, a sustainability foundation to more flexibility within you know, physical retail. And so a lot of retailers are redoing all their fixtures, right? So they're, they're movable, even like lights you know, and, and whatnot. And they, they've said, you know, it's been fascinating because different people in the organization have, have owned this, right? In the same organization. And what they've realized when they've kind of gotten to the end, they're like, wow, we all spent, right? We all had, even from the same, vendor we had very different terms let alone looking at other vendors so i this is a, a recent conversation it's uh I, I think it's it's really quite uh quite incredible in terms of, of what we've seen so if, if we look at the the next slide and kind of you know i think this is always the you know what what i worry about are like you know i mean i like to look at headwinds and tailwinds and you know what are the the headwinds right what what is the what what does it take to kind of get you know the these retailers and brands to just kind of the next level and this you know kind of i i remember back from when i was working at a um retail tech startup and right we were always shocked just you know kind of um the amount of effort that had to go in to kind of you know get the data into a place that we could then analyze it and you know sometimes that that just took an, an unbelievable amount of time and and sometimes would would slow us down you know david according to our study you know these were the top three data headwinds that that we identified you know from your point of view what do you think are the biggest challenges for managing gnfr i i think these three are are very very common so i agree with the output of your study i think the one i would add uh, or I'd put more emphasis on is enrichment. You know, the, the it, it understanding, and, and by the way, every tool that's been built in, in, in our opinion is, is, is kind of cute because it organizes your data and it shows you, you know, what you buy and who you buy it from and it cleans up A, T and T and A dot T dot T and that kind of stuff and that's great. But if it's not enriched with real meaningful data from outside your four walls, you're, you're just organizing bad buying. It isn't enhancing it. So I think enrichment is really the one that, but a lot of our clients haven't had a chance to get to it because they're still dealing with, you know, they grew by acquisition, they have multiple ERP systems, they don't talk to each other, you know, trying to get it all into one clean taxonomy is, is, is the biggest challenge. And, but I think when they sort that out, and a lot of them spend a lot of money to sort it out, they're still left wanting because they're not able to enrich. And, and I would say, if you're looking at tools in the market for this, Make sure you think beyond your most immediate challenge, which is right in your face, which is I can't see what I'm buying. You're going to fix that with every tool on the market. What you're not going to fix is enriching it. So you got to ask that question or you're just going to organize bad buying. I mean, this, this idea around data enrichment, I think, is, is really you know, kind of quite critical. And, it, you know, as, as you look at kind of the, the internal data and, and combine it with third party, I mean, Joe is as we think about this, you know, what are the different types of data logic sources looking at in their indirect procurement program? Yeah, I think, um, you know, David made the point around con you know, spend under contract, you know, the, the internal stuff is the basics, right, which is the contract piece, but also how was it bought? Was it P card? Was it PO? Was it a non invoice uh, or a non PO invoice? Um, or, you know, did it go off the, the approved supplier list or not? From outside, I think for us, um, a range of stuff. So, you know, financial stability and risk associated with the different suppliers that make up the supply chain. Um, what is the what is the overall ownership structure of that organization? And can we go up to the go up to the parent level and negotiate across all of the sub brands with the with the entire spend? Obviously, we've talked about is the supplier diverse, not diverse? 
um, are they sustainable? You know, what are the, what are their practices and procedures around sustainability, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you know those are all additional features that we can bring into a spend feed to inform it with information about the suppliers with which the organization is doing business. There, there's so much to unpack there, but I know we're we're running short on time, and I do want to apologize to the audience for not having gotten to all of your questions. But uh, we we will respond after uh, the event today. So so let's close it out here, which is. You know, this is, it's like, you know, we've, we've kind of, we've laughed, we've cried, we've, you know, we've talked about tailwinds and headwinds, but, but now how, how do retailers, how do those of you who are joining us today build a best in class, you know, kind of data analytics function? And, you know, David, do you want to talk about, right, this answer on outsourcing GNFR capabilities? I mean, how, how do, you know, how do these, these retailers, right, with about half of them, you know, kind of responding that they believe outsourcing is the best approach. And I think we're seeing even more of that, right, kind of at, at this part of the pandemic. But but how do they, they in their own minds, think about the pros of insourcing versus outsourcing? And, and how do they come to this, this answer? Yeah, I mean, to, to me, it's the same money management analogy. You know, are you going to be as good at it as Merrill and Morgan or pick your favorite one? And, and do you have the capability to look into, you know, equities and currencies and blah, blah, blah that they're going to have? You know, and, and, you know, it's very, very hard for an organization to justify the amount of category leadership they would need to be really good at this. So I would say most of our CFOs are of one of two minds. They either know they want to be really good at it, but they're not there yet. And they hire a firm like us to do what I would call a build, operate, transfer. Logic source, get me good at it over the next 18 to 24 months and transfer everything back to me. The second mindset is I don't want to be good at it. You do it. And as long as you pay for yourself X times over, you can stay here. Most of our CFOs are in one of those decisions. There are a few organizations out there that have really nailed this and have built truly, you know, world-class sourcing and procurement capability across the enterprise. Uh, and, and most of them are getting poached by big tech who's stealing their category managers right now. Um, so it, it's challenging. Um, but I would say that the, that's the decision tree the CFOs are in. But I'd say regardless of whether you know you want to own it in-house, or you know you don't want to, find a firm that will help you accelerate it and go get the money. So you don't have to fire your great people. You can take the money out of your suppliers to fund innovation and give, give the option to yourself to bring it back in-house if you want or let a third party run it for you. Yeah, maybe we'll end on a controversial slash interesting note. Uh, based on uh, you know what you just said in terms of you know, some of this talent, because I do think that, you know, a lot of the big tech companies, right, is they, they've got their own data analytics in many cases, and they can see why wow, this is a huge opportunity. Do you think that those organizations, right, if we were to look across industries, do they better understand the, 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 the importance here, the, the opportunity here, and, and our retailers, right, because the, you know, their business is so complex and, right, changes every day, do they just have so many more balls in the air that this often falls to, let's just say, maybe not top three things that they're focusing on at the moment? Some of it is that big tech have endless work desks to, to spend money on this stuff that retail and CPG don't. Um, so, and I think they have a kind of very insular culture, many of them, and they want to build it. You know, but I'm, I'm blown away, especially on the West Coast, at what the price tag for some category managers going to Google and Facebook and Apple are. You're talking CEO, CFO compensation in most parts of the country for a category manager. Um, and it's very hard to compete with that. I, I, I think it, it, I mean, I think it's incredibly challenging right now what, what these retailers and brands are facing in terms of, of talent, inflation, you know, just this, you know, and, and I think that, you know, going back to our conversation today, right? Organizations have gotten so much smarter, right? That and, and retailers, right? You don't have more data than you do in a, in a retail organization. And trying to figure out what to do that in for resale and goods not for resale, I, I think it's it's incredibly complex. I think that you know they're they're lucky to have you as a partner. And so, mm -hmm. I I know that this was kind of a whistle stop tour of of an incredibly important topic. Once again, especially as we're you know kind of unpacking more around holiday inflation, sustainability, you know, diversity and inclusion, and so. You know, David and Joe, thank you for, uh, you know, helping us think through this. Uh, many of you had questions around, you know, kind of a, a case study and whatnot, and, and we will be sharing out, you know, more specifics around retailers and brands that have worked with Logic Source. And just really want to thank you for joining us today. 
David Joe, this is uh, fascinating. We want to really thank you and uh, looking forward to learning more. Thank you for your time and thank thanks you for all the us. participants and the great questions. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thanks, thanks Joe. Everyone. And uh, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.